Are you range betting every flop and feel like something is missing in your game? Today I'm going to show you how you can level up your c-betting game and increase your EV in theory and practice. Let's get started. First, let's take a brief walk through the history of poker c-betting to see how we got to the point of range betting everywhere. The late great Doyle Brunson was one of the first people to pioneer the concept of c-betting in his book Super System. He correctly identified that the preflop raiser generally had a stronger range than the preflop caller and therefore could continuation bet nearly 100% of the time. Initially, people would just c-bet everything, generally for around a two-thirds sizing. This really wrecked early players because games were super passive and people were overfolding and under check raising like crazy. When they did call, they were massively overfolding to turn and river barrels. So you've raised the preflop, you've been called. Flop comes down, now you want to bet about half to two thirds of the pot. Every time that your opponents have completely missed, they're going to fold. When they have hit, they're going to raise you, and if you have no hand, you can muck, and it's still going to be a profitable play because of all the times you picked up the dead money. The next evolution of c-betting came in the form of a more refined, intuitive, polarized strategy where players would estimate how much money their hand was worth, put an appropriate amount of money in throughout the hand. Doug Polk would later refine this strategy, which is similar to what he uses in the Upswing Poker Lab. He would categorize hands into four categories. Category 1, your best hands. Category 2, your medium strength hands. Category 3, good draws. Category 4, complete trash. You would bet category 1 and 3 hands and check back category 2 and 4 hands. This would protect your check back range somewhat and prevent you from getting run over in certain lines. This strategy worked well for a number of years, but players quickly realized that if you're only checking back medium strength hands, they could aggressively overbet turns and rivers and apply pressure to your capped range. Now we'll take a look at the range bet everything strategy. This was mainly developed from Nick Howard in his PO Unlocked series right after PO Solver was released. Nick identified that in most spots you could see bet your entire range for a small size and not lose much EV in theory. This also functioned well as an exploit, which we will get to later. This strategy became extremely popular and is still used today. C betting has become a lot more popular just because of um, like that basically like running solvers has taught us that it's kind of like a range on range battle. So when you have a range advantage on certain boards, you can bet a very small amount to make your opponent um, somewhat indifferent to continuing. So you don't have to make like a large bet to price people out. You can just attack it with a huge portion of your range with a very small bet. You know, when you when you kind of take away from getting to the like the, the GTO point, you get people who are either under defending or like over aggressing versus it. Also, people use the small C bet on wrong boards too. You know, there are certain boards where it doesn't work well, um, and you get a lot of players that don't check raise versus it enough. You know, you have to you know to combat the small C bet, you have to use a a lot of different tactics to you know kind of put your opponent on the spot. And I think a lot of people have figured out to do the small C bet, they just don't know how to progress afterwards. So if this strategy works well in theory and as an exploit, what's the problem with it? Let's take a look at why it works well as an exploit against weaker players. In order to combat this strategy, your opponent will have to check raise really aggressively. If we compare the response to a GTO betting strategy and a range bet, you will see a massive difference in the check raising frequency. This is very difficult for even advanced players to get correct. Most pools, at mid stakes and below aren't check raising enough to even hit the GTO frequency, much less a frequency that will prevent you from range betting everything. Also, lower stakes players are slightly overfolding to range bets, in addition to under check raising. If players are performing so poorly against this, why shouldn't we do it? Well, the main reason is that the hand doesn't stop on the flop. We have to navigate turns and rivers, and that can be difficult with such a wide range. To understand the situation better, let's take a look at this sim where we're button versus big blind and now we're going to range bet everything on the flop. If we look at the flop, the in position player has a total equity advantage of 54 to 45. So that makes sense, right? Because we're the ones that open pre-flop so we have a stronger range than the big blind who just called. Don't pay attention to these ranges, these are just simplified ranges, I just uh, made them pure just to exemplify the point and make it easier to read. So we look at the equity, so who has the equity advantage now? It's right, the imposition player. 
but once there's a bet and a call before any turn cards come out if we look in positions equity is now dropped if we just select any turn card and then go to the hotness tool here we can see out of position has an equity advantage on every single card this is a huge reason why c betting everything is a big mistake on turns and rivers and how it has implications on these later streets because now we're in a much different position than we started with on the flop of course any time that we bet the flop and the out of position player calls they're going to gain equity but in this case we've seen about our entire range so we're carrying our entire range to the turn whereas the out of position player if we look at his range he's filtered his range down to just stronger hands he's folded all of his trash so now he's carrying a stronger range on the turn in the river, and that's going to have implications to our strategy later, which makes it much more difficult to navigate. Common mistake I see players making after C betting, range betting every flop is they bet the turn too often. Now what's happening in this situation is we're just barreling into every turn card where the out of position player has an equity advantage, and that could be a huge mistake depending on how you structure your ranges. Another reason why range betting everything can be a poor strategy in weaker pools is because the pools simply don't check raise enough so we don't get paid with our value. So our bluffs do increase in EV, but our value hands actually lose value. So let's take a look. A hand like pocket threes on this board, it has 220% uh, EV, meaning it's going to make money on future streets. But how is that money made? Well. Part of the way money is made is by our opponent check raising all of these hands here. So we see all these smattering of hands here, which are mainly some draws, but then we have some hands with backdoor potential, like ace five offsuit with the ace of diamonds. If the opponent isn't putting in money with these sort of bluffs, then the EV of our value hands goes way down. Makes it a lot more difficult to get money in on future streets if the opponent isn't raising us enough. So how can we combat that? Well, the answer is to have a more polarized strategy in certain spots. This plays right into the pool's weaknesses where they don't raise enough. We're actually putting them in a spot to where they're going to play naturally and defend all of their ace x and maybe even defend too many king x. So when we have our value hands, we're just going to put our money in. We can look at our two pairs. We're obviously putting in money with uh, two pair hands as well. And then we can bet even as thin as something like a7, a6, we're mixing it in a little bit, but I would mainly just simplify it to checking these and just betting like maybe a10 and better in this spot. And then we backfill that with a ton of bluffs. We're, the main bluffs we're going to have are gut shots in this line. We're also going to have some random cards here with uh, like jack five of spades we have the backdoor flush draw and future blocker to straights same thing with the 10-5 we also have some hands that are kind of in unintuitive like we have 10-7 of hearts here quite a bit the reason why we have to bet these sort of hands is because on runouts where the straight does complete we simply don't have enough bluffs so we need to start mixing in some of these air balls that do have good future blockers into that range Another range that you probably are missing is a hand like pocket fours with a club. This is a pretty big um, thing to miss because what can happen is if your opponent knows that you don't have enough bluffs on future runouts, he'll just start overfolding. So we start mixing these in. These are okay because they have clean two card outs. So for example, when we overbet here and the turn is never going to be a four of clubs, that uh, four of hearts or four of diamonds is always going to be a clean uh, set out for us. So that's always nice to have. Plus we have a future blocker for a flush if we want to represent the flush later on. And that just gives us enough bluffs on every run out that we can think of. So when you study this strategy, you really wanna make sure you're hitting some of these as well. In addition to some of these polarized air balls like 10-6 of hearts. So on the left hand side, we have ace key six here and on the right side we have the exact same board on the left side we're range betting everything and on the right side we have an over bet and check strategy you can see that the EV loss is about three percent I've uh, set PO solver to give me the EV in percentage so a three percent EV loss is pretty huge 
And I would argue this is going to be even worse because if we look at the, the sim on the left here, when we bet small, the opponent has to raise 14% of the time. If we look at his strategy, it's uh, very hard to replicate this strategy. So he's gonna have to mix in a lot of these like ace-10 offsuit, ace-9 offsuit sort of hands. Uh, queen three of spades that that one's pretty reasonable but then all these like lower ones like six three of hearts i don't think is going to happen very often and uh five three of diamonds four three of diamonds these are very tough check raises to find so uh, i think what's going to happen is even though it's not represented on the sim this we actually gain some ev with like pocket sixes and the sim on the left i think this is actually going to go down also, I think our fold equity is much better on the sim on the right when we do have a bluff. So when we bet with a hand like a, a gutter, like queen jack, we can get them to fold a ton of king x. So that's a good spot to be in. So overall, we're just going to increase our EV in theory. And I think in practice, it's going to uh, increase as well. Let's compare the turn strategies in these two sims. So just for reference again, on the left hand sim, we have the range bet, everything on the flop. And on the right hand sim, we went ahead and polarized the flop. And now we're looking at a complete brick, the three of hearts. You can see on the left side that the in position player has to check back a vast majority of his range, almost 64% uh, of his range, because he put in too much money on the flop with weak hands like queens, uh, jacks, tens, nines, eights, and now he has to check back pure all of these king x, check back a ton of ace x. And now on the right hand side, the opponent doesn't have any of those. The, or, um, the imposition player doesn't have any of those because the imposition player didn't bet pocket queens, jacks, tens, nines. Those are in a completely separate line. So this strategy is a lot more intuitive to follow and we don't have to check back as much. We know that we can just continue betting with our strongest hands, like even as low as like ace 10 offsuit here, we can continue putting in money. And then we can just check some of our middling ace x, check back some draws so we have some draws in our check back line, and then continue betting a bunch of bluffs. These uh, pocket six, or these uh, six x hands make great bluffs because our opponent's um, strongest hand is pocket sixes. So when we block that, it, these just make super nice bluffs to have. Plus they also have some things going for them like uh, straight blockers and flush blockers on certain runouts. So these are pretty good to have as well. So overall, it's just a much easier strategy to play on the right because we put hands in our range that want to play a polarized strategy instead of trying to fit everything into the range. And on the left, you can see what happens is when we get to this node and we check back and then we face, so let's just say like the eight of hearts, same thing here, we check back, we face the eight of hearts and we'll just pick the most common bet size. So here it's uh, 158 and here it's just a third. You can see it's very tough because now we have all these hands in this line that have to pure fold the river and it's kind of hard to navigate this. Like calling pocket queens and then folding pocket jacks is very unintuitive. And then full, having to call a hand like a queen eight offsuit, but then fold pocket jacks. Again, it's just very tough to make that. Whereas here in this scenario, we're not really folding that many hands that are bad. So if we look, we're just folding like complete give up, give ups like a queen 10 suited. We're calling some 8x, we're raising some 8x, but then we just have all these ace x we just naturally call with. We have a, just a few combos of king x that we call with. So we just have a very natural way to play on the right hand side, whereas on the left hand side, we have to manage all these different parts of our range and it makes it a lot more complicated on the uh, turn and river. Okay, so to wrap it up, what can we learn from all this? Well, one is if we simplify our flop strategy, then that can make navigating the turn and river very difficult. Another thing to consider are population tendencies. If we're playing a strategy because the population is too passive, but we're relying on them to be aggressive to get money in on earlier streets and get all the money in by the river, then that could be a poor strategy. So when you're thinking about simplifying different spots, you need to think about 
how different runouts affect your ranges and how they affect your opponent's ranges. And you want to try to navigate them into spots to where they're going to make the biggest mistakes and you're going to make the least amount of mistakes. So next time you see an Ace-King-X flop, go ahead and polarize. 